ways to show that we are thinking of other people. We help to make our meetings with other people courteous by using such words as please. Whenever we ask for anything, it shows our friendliness and courtesy if we ask with please. On the other hand, thank you is a simple way to repay those who do things for you. Another expression we need all the time is excuse me. It lets other people know that you are thinking of them when you say excuse me. Still, another way to smooth your meetings with other people is, may I? The Civilizing Process was a study published in 1939 by the German sociologist Norbert Elias. Ignored for years and often misunderstood, the book only became influential in the 1980s and today is both highly lauded and widely criticized at the same time. At its core, the civilizing process is an analysis of how society and psychology interact and how they both change over time. For Elias, from around the 11th to the 16th centuries in the West, a change occurred. People became more civilized. Their manners, etiquette and tendency towards violence all became more controlled. The book asks why. The breadth of his answer involves history, psychology, sociology, politics, culture and economics and jumps from medieval knights to modern businessmen. In other words, it's a wide-ranging and difficult book. At its heart are questions about what's rational, what's intentional, what control and impulse mean and how these things fit into social and psychological life. He says that the civilizing process is the way that emotional and rational impulses of individual people constantly interweave in a friendly or hostile way. But what exactly is rationality? It's the ability to understand the balance between short-term immediate desires, impulses and emotions and the long-term consequences of acting on these immediate drives. It's the difference between punching someone in the street because you're angry and the ability to control this impulse because of the consequences. Is this impulse control natural, cultural or maybe both? Elias argues that to begin to understand the answer to this we can look to an important place in the history of the West, the royal court. In the medieval period and before, tribes, nobles, groups, different estates were unintegrated across Europe. They were independent units with no common code or law. They fought for land, food and power. Knights fought each other for control in a state of anarchy and there was no higher authority. When nobles have control over an area of land through force and are only dependent on that land, the moderation of their drives, their immediate desires and what Elias calls their affects is unnecessary. They act on their will, on their impulse. But slowly, one group begins to dominate. A king emerges and the other groups must accept their subordinate position. The king begins to keep order and negotiation between the groups becomes more important than outright violence interdependence between individual groups increases. This leads to a new type of logic. The king is dependent on the nobles to keep power and the nobles are dependent on the king and each other to negotiate their positions in the social hierarchy, each jockeying for advantage. As this progressed into the modern era, the king needed the nobles as a counterweight to the bourgeoisie and the bourgeoisie as a counterweight to the nobles. Again, you have this increasing interdependence, out of which a logic emerges. The royal court is the centre of political negotiation, where all of politics takes place. The nobleman and knight knows he won't be attacked in this regulated space, but this means he can't have outbursts either. He must suppress his impulses. Knights that live by conquest and violence are slowly replaced by nobility who negotiate. Negotiating and jockeying not only means repressing your immediate impulses, but also concealing what those impulses are, hiding what it is that you really want and not showing your hand in case others use it against you.
It becomes about reading others. In the royal court, Elias writes, an individual is always seen in his social contacts as a human being in relation to others. He continues, Affective outbursts are difficult to control and calculate. They reveal the true feelings of the person concerned to a degree that, because not calculated, can be damaging. They hand over trump cards to rivals for favour and prestige. Above all, they are a sign of weakness. Being savvy becomes about knowing what others want so as to be useful to them and others. This involves reading intentions, motivations, acquiring symbolic capital, coalition building so as to convince each other. The French philosopher Jean de la Bruyère wrote in the 17th century that a man who knows the court is master of his gestures, of his eyes and of his face. He is profound, impenetrable. He dissimulates bad offices, smiles at his enemies, controls his irritation, disguises his passions, belies his heart, speaks and acts against his feelings. This leads to a new type of court rationality, which is where we get the word courteous from today. A 1736 dictionary tells us that Courtesy undoubtedly gets its name from the court and court's life. The court of great lords are a theatre where everyone wants to make his fortune. This can only be done by winning the favour of the prince and the most important people of his court. One therefore takes all conceivable pains to make oneself agreeable to them. Nothing does this better than making the other believe that we are ready to serve him to the utmost of our capacity under all conditions. As further evidence of this change, Elias draws from the proliferation of books and pamphlets on manners and etiquette that appear at the end of the Middle Ages and beginning of the modern period. The famed Dutch philosopher Erasmus, for example, published an influential treatise called On Civility in Children in 1530. It became a bestseller. In books like this, we see courteous behaviour spreading outward from the court and nobles to wider society. Erasmus's book warns against there being snot on your nostrils or wiping your nose on your coat advising you to clean the communal spoon after using it, or warning against putting your hands in the broth. Avoid gnawing at the bone and putting it back in the dish, turn around when coughing, etc. Other pamphlets warn against things like getting so angry that you regret it afterwards. So the first condition of the process for Elias is the monopolization of power, of having a single authority that controls and in some way outlaws violence, so that others must control their impulses. This might also be understood as state formation or centralization. He writes, as the structure of human relations changes, as monopoly organizations of physical force develop and the individual is held no longer in the sway of constant feuds and wars, but rather in the more permanent compulsions of peaceful functions based on the acquisition of money or prestige, affect expressions too slowly gravitate towards a middle line. The fluctuations in behavior and affects do not disappear, but are moderated, the peaks and abysses are smaller, the changes less abrupt. But this points to another reason that this whole process starts happening, and it's not reliant on the court or a centralized state necessarily. Elias calls it interdependence. He says that as society becomes more complicated, individuals contribute different functions towards the economy. Butcher, baker, brewer, engineer, they're all intertwined in one interdependent function. Each provides for the other. There is a division of labor, which means we have a dependency on other people. This interdependency leads to a network, a chain, a tempo, in the same way that there's an interdependence in the royal court. He writes that as more and more people must attune their conduct to the character of others, the web of actions must be organized more and more strictly and accurately if each individual action is to fulfill its social function. He calls it the lengthening chains of social interdependence. We must all consider the effect of our actions further down the chain. 
Essentially, this means that a single person can't do what they want all the time. Self-constraint must be practiced if the economy is going to function. Overall, he writes that what lends the civilizing process in the West its special and unique character is the fact that here the division of functions has attained a level, the monopolies of force and taxation a solidity, an interdependence and competition an extent, both in terms of physical space and of numbers of people involved, unequaled in human history. So interdependence and state formation, monopoly on violence, centralization of some kind are the causes. But he goes further to argue that these sociological processes become psychologized into our habitus. He argues that culturally, these new attitudes are taught to and absorbed by children from a young age. Those key necessities for existing in a new and different society to the old one are things like foresight and self-restraint, impulse control, stricter rules on behaviour, the stigmatisation of certain bad habits and social and political penalties for those that display them. All of these become ingrained at a young age. He draws on Freud to argue that these things become ingrained into our super-egos or our consciences. In other words, the little voice in our head that tells us, no, these things become second nature to us. They're not the product of rational calculation each and every time we're making a decision. Ideologically, the civilizing process is a difficult book. On the one hand, it argues that emotional and social attitudes are malleable and socially and culturally constructed. On the other hand, it suggests that these attitudes are more refined and that certain countries are more civilized than others. That being said, Elias only uses civilized in the way in which he is attempting to understand what is meant by the term when people use it in the West. He's not necessarily valuing it positively or negatively. And in fact, even though he argues that individual impulses and violence have been regulated within any given Western society, he does maintain that this does not stop states from, for example, being outwardly violent. In other words, one can be more civilized in Elias's sense and still commit genocide. He says that this violence isn't necessarily minimized, but can sometimes be redirected. But almost all historians do agree that violence has declined across the period Elias is talking about, and that he has one of the only convincing arguments for why this is the case. But the logic is hard to ignore. Nonetheless, a number of criticisms have of course been pointed to. One involves whether the change from medieval brutality to modern civility was as far-reaching and large as Elias suggests. Evidence from the period is difficult to find and analyse, and many scholars of the period argue that it wasn't as violent as Elias depicts. Other critics obviously are also critical of the language of civilising or civilization, often associated with colonialism or barbarism, while others still have pointed to tribal communities where violence is lower than more centralised states. A problem for Elias's theory. Overall though, it's a powerful and thorough book, and its importance cannot be disputed. But it will still be the subject of debate for many, many decades to come. If you like these videos, I need your help, and here's my request. If you think you get the same value from four of these videos as you do from just one cup of coffee, then please consider pledging just a dollar per video. That's three to four dollars per month to keep this channel going. You can even limit your pledge to one dollar a month, and if you pledge five dollars, I'll add your name to the credits. To those that already support Then and Now, thank you so much. This channel just wouldn't exist without you. You can also hit like, share, follow me on Twitter and Facebook, etc. All of these things really contribute to helping Then and now grow. Thanks for watching and see you next week.